Thank you everyone for, for joining us here today. Uh, the context for this talk is about a year, a little more than a year ago, uh, the Microsoft team uh, and collaborators put out a paper on what we call the topological gap protocol, which is a, a protocol designed to identify topological superconductivity in a nanowire. Then in this past March, the station Q meeting, uh, we shared that we had some devices that a number of devices that had passed that protocol. We put out uh, on the archive in early June, we submit out to the archive paper detailing some of these results. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to further explain what we did, maybe give you a little bit of a reader's guide to make it easier to read the paper uh, and very importantly, take questions. So I don't want to spend too much time on the prepared uh, remarks and want to spend as much time on the Q&A as possible. And what I'm going to be telling you about today is, is really a work of a, of a total team effort from the Microsoft team. And I'm really um, most honored and, and uh, happy to be uh, able to represent the team here today. So um, I'm going to start off by just, you know, uh, give you the punchline off the bat or the, the main takeaway points uh, of um, today's talk, which is, uh, a couple of questions. First of all, how can a topological phase of a device be identified experimentally? Uh, and in the particular case, depends on the topological phase, in the particular case of topological superconductivity in the nanowires, I'm going to argue that that's the topological gap protocol. Um, how do we make a device that's sufficiently clean as to have a topological phase? As I'll argue, the main enemy here is disorder, various forms of imperfection. And so we need to make a device that's sufficiently clean. And um, what I'll argue is that the key is to minimize the density of charge defects and keep them as far from the active region as possible. And then uh, lastly, are there devices that pass the topological gap protocol? And the answer I'm going to give is, yep, we do have multiple devices. They have topological gaps in the range of 20 to 30 microvolts passing the topological gap protocol. Okay, so those are the main takeaway points. What I'll do now is give some more detail around that and then again, open it up for question and answer. So basic framework, uh, identifying topological phase in an experiment. Okay, so experimental identification of topological phases, the approach we're taking is we're gonna measure some non-universal properties of a device or of this particular phase of matter in the device that are indirect signatures of the topological phase, okay? So we have some device sitting down in the bottom of the dilution refrigerator. We're gonna take a wealth of transport data as a function of various parameters and then analyze that data. If the data satisfies certain criteria, which are, again, they are dependent on the particular phase of matter and dependent on the particular, some of the aspects of the device, they're not directly topological invariants, but if the data satisfies a number of criteria, then it's a topological phase. If it doesn't, it's in the trivial phase. Now, wh why would we do this and when is this useful? Okay, we're gonna test this first of all using simulated data. So under realistic conditions, test with simulated data, test this protocol and estimate the probability that you might pass, that you would satisfy all the criteria even if you weren't in the topological phase. and design the protocol or improve the protocol if necessary so that it weeds out those so-called false positives. You know, the phrase that we've all gotten used to during COVID times of the false positive ratio to make that as low as possible, okay? And so we designed the protocol and developed it so that we would have very few false positives so that it would high, with high probability identify a topological phase. How high does that probability need to be? I mean, what would an acceptable ratio of false positives be? What would be an acceptable ratio of states in which are actually in the trivial phase, but pass the protocol? Well, we want to be low enough to proceed to the next step, which is to actually measure a topological invariant, which is to say, to perform something like fusion and braiding. The re a reason why this is necessary, I would say that it's not just nice to have, but something you need to have is, when we say we're gonna perform fusion or braiding, what we actually mean is we're going to apply a sequence of control pulses to some device that's sitting in the bottom of the fridge, perform a sequence of readout or measurements, and then we're going to interpret the result as having performed braiding and then having measured the topological charge 
that results. But that interpretation, again, of really just sending a sequence of voltage pulses and measuring some capacitance shifts, perhaps, or conductance shifts, you could only have that interpretation if you actually understand your device pretty well, that you know, for instance, that one region is in one phase of matter, another region is another, that at the boundaries you have some kind of quasi-particles or defects, that the voltage pulses are actually moving them or doing something that you like and that you're measuring topological charge. So although we want to measure some topological invariance, what you're actually doing is something very device dependent and even model dependent and interpreting that in terms of fusion and braiding. So you actually need to understand quite a great deal about your device. And this step one is a part of that bring up procedure to enable that. All right. The particular setting in which you are applying this, although I think it applies more generally to topological phase, the particular setting that we're applying this is Myron and zero modes in proximitized semiconductor nanowires. The idea is, and here for, for the moment, I'll be fairly abstract in general, consider a very simplified model, and we'll get to the specifics of our devices later. What we have here is the Hamiltonian of single band in a or single subband in a semiconductor nanowire. By assumption, there's a large spin orbit coupling, which here is just taken to be a Rashba spin orbit coupling. What that does is it spin splits the bottom of the conduction band, splitting those parabolas. By large here, I mean larger than about four or five MeV nanometers. We need a large G factor, large here meaning in the range of 10 to 50. If we have a large G factor, then a relatively modest magnetic field can open up a gap uh, at the crossing at zero momentum between those two spin, spin split bands. We also want to be able to control the density in the wire so that we can put the chemical potential into a regime in which there's only two Fermi crossings, one of positive, one of negative momentum. And then under those circumstances, if we have a good interface for the superconductor, then the type of superconductivity that we will induce in the wire through the proximity effect will be topological superconductivity. For that particular model, the phase diagram is fairly simple as a function of the two basic control parameters, which is chemical potential on the y-axis and the Zeeman energy on the x-axis. There's in blue at low fields, trivial phase. As you increase field, you go into what's depicted here in red, which is the topological phase that's at high fields. At low fields, the density of states is the basic BCS form. What I'm showing here is the local density of states as a function of energy and position along the wire. There's a gap in which there's no states, and then above the gap you have states. You see some ripples here that are due to finite size effects in this calculation. If you go into the topological phase, which is in red by increasing the field, then you go into a phase in which the density of states actually in most of the wire looks just about the same as it does in the trivial phase, However, at the ends of the wire, there are peaks in the local density of states, which are associated with, although they're not unique signatures of, those Meyer on a zero modes. Now, that's obviously a very simplified model. We can make this model a little bit less simplified by considering the effects of disorder on such a model. So still, still a very simplified model, single subband, semiconductor, Rashba spin orbit coupling, um, proximitized, but we're going to include what we have here in blue is the potential V of X, random potential. Uh, I've replaced what I was calling V sub X, which was the Zeeman energy by a G factor times the magnetic field. And uh, by assumption here, for, th for this particular case, we'll say that that random potential has variance V RMS and has a correlation length kappa. Okay. Now we have enough parameters here that in order to put down a fit to, to compute the phase diagram, I'll have to put some numbers in. So I will take the parameters and these are not fit parameters. These are not something that I will I'm using to fit data that goes into the tuple gap protocol. These are parameters that are here for illustrative purposes, although they are interesting, an interesting parameter set. Um, we'll put in some um, effective mass, G factor, Rashba spin orbit coupling, uh, one second here. Uh, Rosh must in orbit coupling and um, coupling to the to the superconductor gap of the parent superconductor and length finite length of the wire. And for the for this set of parameters, 
what happens is as we increase the strength of disorder, that parabola starts to distort as a result of the disorder. And eventually, as the disorder gets large enough, it starts to fracture into small, small, smaller regions of topological phase, and eventually gets very strongly suppressed. So it moves to higher chemical potential and also moves to higher magnetic field and eventually gets destroyed by disorder. Okay. So there's a disorder-driven quantum phase transition as we increase disorder strength. Now, in a finite system, so this is fairly long, but it's still finite, three micron long system, the phase transition as a function of disorder strength is not sharp. Okay. So what you'll find is that if I draw from that probability distribution a number of different single realization of disorder, and what I showed you on the last slide was actually a single realization of disorder each was disorder strength. I didn't average over disorder. What you'll see is that the fraction of those disorder realizations for which there is a topological phase, as measured by the Fathian invariant, is going to be a monotonically decrease, smoothly decreasing function of increasing disorder strength. Okay. If this were the thermodynamic limit, so as L goes to infinity, this would be a sharp step function. And for weaker dis weak disorder, every single one of these would be in the topological phase. And for strong disorder, none of them would be. Here we see a, a, in a device of this length, there's a continuous decrease that, as a function of VRMS. Now, the translation from microscopic disorder, the various types of microscopic disorder that you'll have in the device, to this one number that I've written here, VRMS, depends strongly on the details of device design. And in fact, it's more than just one number. But it nevertheless, this illustrates the basic phenomenon that we'll have in a device of this type with roughly these kinds of parameters. Okay. And what this means is, given that this depends on details of device design, that we have a target here, that we want to be in a range where the yield, the, the fraction of our devices that are going to show a topological phase will be reasonably high. And the device design will have to enable that. And the fabrication method will also, and the process will have to enable that if we want to make progress here and find a topological phase. Right. So now we can get a bit more specific, understanding that, yep, one of the, one of the goals of device design is to get us into that window. Our devices are based on two-dimensional electron gases in indium arsenide quantum wells. There is an aluminum strip on top of the semiconductor, so it has it is narrow. It's narrower than about 120 nanometers. It is going into the plane of the slide there. There's also dielectric and gates. The purpose of those gates will be um, clear momentarily, but basically they are to deplete the two decks so that you define through those gates in combination with the aluminum, a semiconductor nanowire. There's no etching to define the wire, it's entirely through the gates. So we look at it from the top, you can see there's a number of these gates, which, were, which we call plunger gates. The purpose of those gates, as well as the gates on the other side of the aluminum strip. So there's an aluminum strip down the middle of this device. When those gates are energized, the two DAG, the two dimensional electron gas is depleted almost everywhere, except the aluminum screens the electric fields due to the gates. And so you are left with uh, ele density, electron density in the semiconductor underneath the aluminum. And that is our nanowire. Now, the gates that we call the plunger gates, they are mostly screened by the aluminum, but there are some additional, there are some fringe fields that survive. Those can be used as we increase or make more negative the voltage on the plunger gate. We can control the density in the semiconductor under the aluminum. This is done on the outer segments of the device. We make that sufficiently negative as to fully deplete so that you could think of the outer segments as being just the aluminum strips and fully depleted semiconductor underneath. But we don't do that to the middle segment because that's the one we want to tune into the topological phase by tuning the density correctly or appropriately, as well as the magnetic field. If we do that, we end up in a we would want to end up in a situation in which you have a topological phase in the middle segment that would have, for instance, in its local density of states, Majorana zero modes, like shown. And then you'll notice that there are junctions on the sides of the device that we can use through transport experiments to detect the Majorana zero modes, as well as other features of the device. Okay, so that was a schematic rendering. Here's an SEM of an actual device, which you can see is quite similar to what we were just looking at. Okay.
Now with a specific device design in mind, we can look at a more realistic phase diagram. That was a highly idealized, simplified phase diagram of a single subband model that I showed you earlier. If we make the phase, if we compute the phase diagram for the device I just showed you, still idealized in the sense that there's no disorder, and for the moment, I'll treat the device as being infinitely long, then in such a case, the phase diagram looks like this. Okay, some important differences are, first of all, whereas on the left, it's just a single subband model by construction. On the right, there are multiple subbands, potentially multiple, there are multiple subbands in, in this gate defined nanowire. And as you make the voltage more negative, you will deplete more and more of those subbands. There is a lowest subband, which is the one that you see at the bottom uh, of that um, phase diagram. The Parameters here, the X and Y axes of the, of the phase diagram, these are now the actual control parameters. They're not effective parameters sitting in, in that model Hamiltonian, which was a, a Zeeman splitting and a chemical potential. This is the plunger gate voltage on that specific gate and the magnetic field. You also notice that there's a band, there's a region there where uh, a white band that cuts through several of those topological lobes. So you'll notice the, the parabolic shape in red that you have on the left has become a sequence of slivers corresponding to that are squashed down parabolas, course, which um, correspond to different numbers of occupied subbands. And you'll see that at higher fields, um, you have kind of a white band that's cutting through that. That is due to the orbital effect of the magnetic field. In the simplified model, we had only the Zeeman coupling, but of course, uh, a, a, a real nanowire will have a cross section that's not negligible. And when the field is large enough, that can approach half of a flux quantum in size, which will strongly suppress the proximity effect. And so you have that suppression. This indicates that A, it's extremely helpful to be in the lowest subband, both to avoid those orbital effects, which are pushed out to really high fields, as well as what's maybe less apparent is that the topological gap, the, the size of the gap is largest in that lowest subband. So whereas on the left, it was just two colors, blue and red. On the right, there's actually a color scale there, which is going from dark blue through white to dark red, where the darkness of the, either the blue or the red is indicating whether the, the energy gap in the trivial phase is larger or smaller or in the topological phase, larger or smaller. Okay. So this is the ideal circumstance, okay? But we also, of course, do have to contend with disorder. We and returning now to the cross section, we simulated several different disorder mechanisms, non uniformity in various geometric parameters, charge defects. And at these low densities, because we were going to operate in the, in the single subband regime, and we've depleted the two deg off to the sides, charge defects in the dielectric are a dominant source of disorder. And the design keeps these defects as far from the active region as possible. Okay. And by as possible, what I really mean is that there is a bit of a Goldilocks regime here, which is by putting the quantum well as far below the surface as possible, we would keep it as far away from those charge defects as possible. And indeed, with quantum wells, you can make the, the, the device extremely clean by making it very far below the surface. However, then we'd have a very poor proximity effect. So we go as far from the surface as possible without totally suppressing the proximity effect. You also can see that if we make the aluminum strip wider, then of course also we'll keep the, those charged, charges in the dielectric further away. But if we make it too wide, it'll be impossible to get into the lower subband. So again, we have to balance between those two and the design balances between those competing imperatives, both in terms of depth and width, okay? To get into the topological phase, so there's some translation between the density of these charge defects in the dielectric and a parameter such as the, the RMS or the variance in the random potential that, that I mentioned in the, in the highly simplified single subband model. Uh, and that what that translation tells us is that we need a density in this interface between the dielectric and the semiconductor to be smaller than around three times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared. Okay. And, and the, the goal of, uh, so A, the design was, one of the principles behind the design was to make that number as large as possible, okay? 
we didn't want to be in a situation in which we needed the density of charge defects to be like 10 to the 11th. That would have been very difficult to accomplish. So the design was designed around making that number as large as possible, but three times 10 to the 12th is still very difficult. The team was able to develop a fabrication process that minimized the density of such defects so as to enable, so as to meet that target. Okay. And in the paper, we, well, let me, let me, sorry, let me re return to that momentarily. So the density of charge impurities, how do we measure them? We extract them from a hall bar that's on the same chip and undergoes the same processing. So this is an optical image. On the right, you have the hall bar. On the left, we have one of these topological gap devices three terminal for three terminal measurements. They undergo all the same processing steps. So anything that we do that would degrade our topological gap device happens to the hall bar as well. We then, in particular, the density of charge defects at the interface between the dielectric and the semiconductor is the same, or as, is as close as you can as uh, uh, as we can make it on the same on the same chip. We then, from a measurement of the density dependence of the hall mobility on that hall bar, we from analysis of that. We extract the density of those charge impurities at the interface between the dielectric and the semiconductor. In this particular data set, it's about 2.7 times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared. Okay. That determines the disorder potential in the wires. So we use that density in simulations in the at the interface in the dielectric and the and the semiconductor, and use that in order to, uh, to, to simulate our devices. And for this particular device design where we require three times 10 to the 12th, what that translates to in terms of mobility is a mobility, a 2D mobility of around 60K or more. Okay. So where that number comes from is really through this entire you know, logical chain. Okay. So having said that now, let's talk about the topological gap protocol. Is detailed in that paper from about a year ago, although we review some basic features in, in the current paper. It relies on transport measurements, two types, local conductance measurements. In particular, there you look, we're looking for zero bias peaks. So the local conductance measurements are like the derivative of I right with respect to V right. We're looking for peaks, such as what I've shown over here. And that's corresponding to current paths, like you can see entering and then going off to the grounds on the ends of the device. We also use non-local conductances. That's to look for a closing in the bulk gap, to look for a phase transition separating different gap phases. That is, for instance, the derivative of I right with respect to V left. That picks up contributions from current paths like what's shown between the two junctions. And um, that vanishes above the parent gap because above the parent gap, any current you by parent gap, I mean the gap of the aluminum. Any current you inject can just run to the ground through the aluminum. It vanishes below the induced gap because below the induced gap, can't push current into the device at all. And then um, between the parent, between the induced gap and the parent gap, that's where it gets its contribution. And so as we increase field and go into the quantum, uh, into the topological phase, that gap that's apparent in the non-local conductances shrinks closes at the phase transition and then reopens, and that's what we look for. So the way the topological gap protocol puts those or uses those uh, types of transport measurements is it's broken into two stages. In stage one, we look for zero bias peaks at both ends of the device, and understanding that zero bias peaks can come from a number of causes. It could come from a quantum dot, some trivial Andrea bound states. We require them to be stable. So. We have got some zero energy states when we see a zero bias peak. We want them to be stable with respect to any changes of the local environment, the junction. Okay. And then we also want them as we move around in the bulk phase diagram. So it's a function of magnetic field and plunger voltage. We want we want sort of a cluster of such points. We want them to be stable over a region, not just at one point. Okay. So that's stage one. And stage one, you should really think of as like a wide scan over four parameters, which is magnetic field and plunger voltage. And plunger voltage, you think of as chemical potential as you move around the bulk phase diagram. And then also the two junction transparencies, which is opening or closing those the two junctions and thereby changing things that are happening locally at the junctions. 
Okay. So this is a wide scan. The thing we don't want to do is to go hunting for a particular feature and then stop when we get there. What we want to do is take a big scan over parameter space, um, but as a function of these four parameters. Once we find interesting regions in that stage one, we zoom in on, on them. We look for where we have closings and reopenings of the gap as measured in the non-local conductance. So that's a phase transition from the conventional superconducting phase to something else. We look and check to see that that something else has stable zero bias peaks. And that's what it takes to pass stage two is regions that are gapped, surrounded by a gapless boundary in parameter space and have stable zero bias peaks. And that's when it, we would interpret that as a device demonstrating the topological phase and extract the size of the topological gap, the gap in the maximum gap in the topological phase from that. This stage two, you can think of as a narrower scan over a smaller region of parameter space, but over more parameters, over six parameters now, magnetic field, plunger gate voltage, junction transparencies, and bias voltages. Okay. So, you know, when I talked about the framework at the beginning, the framework is take a large data set over many parameters, analyze that, require that it satisfies certain criteria in order to pass the protocol. Okay. Now, in order to know whether this is the protocol is good, and where where and in, and in order to help us build a protocol that was stringent and did not allow trivial devices or to pass, we tested it against simulated data. Because in the case of simulated data, we know whether or not the, the in the simulation the device is in the topological phase or not simply by calculating the topological invariant. So we tested against many disorder realizations for this particular device design. Also. Uh, and in this particular case, we tested on relatively clean devices that are comparable to the extracted disorder levels on devices. We also tested for other device designs. We tested it on higher disorder levels. For the particular device design that we're focusing on today, um, we have 38 disorder, different disorder simulations. Most of them failed the topological gap protocol. And we got a negative result. Ten of them passed. They were all true positives in the sense that they are, in fact, there is a topological phase there as determined by the topological invariant, and there were no false positives out of that data set, meaning there were no cases in which the device had only the trivial phase and no topological phase, but passed the topological gap protocol. Okay. Now, uh, and it doesn't mean that I think that the protocol was, is is, is, is guaranteed to work. It's not the same as measuring a topological invariant, but what it does mean is that, and um, we will detail this more in an updated version of the protocol paper, the topological gap protocol paper, is that in, from a statistical perspective, we have a lot of confidence in it and we can use it to analyze data in real experiments. Um, just to show you, so, so the main thing, really the main, the, our main reason for having that sim, the, those simulations and testing the protocol simulated data again is really more around collecting the statistics to see are there cases in which it doesn't um, correctly distinguish to reveal from topological. Having said that, it's interesting to look at some of the data. So here's an example of a disorder realization that passes the TGP. The protocol identifies the hatched region is, is where the topological invariant is, is negative, is minus one. Um, the blue regions are trivial, the protocol classifies as trivial, the system is gapped as far as you can tell from the non-local conductance. There's no stable zero bias peaks. The white is where the system is gapless as identified by the non-local conductance. The yellow regions are also gapless, but they have stable zero bias peaks. And then the orange regions check all the boxes of, of having stable zero bias peaks being and being gapped. And if they are in addition, if their boundaries are gapless, then we identify it as topological, and that's the regions that the black boundary is drawn around. The hatched regions are where the topological invariant is minus one, and you can see that there are hatched regions there that the protocol doesn't even identify, like in the in the bottom right. And you can see that those are yellow. It's probably regions where the gap is relative. They're technically they're topological, but the gap is relatively small, and the protocol doesn't pick it up. There is a region that the protocol does pick up and identify as topological, and it has very large overlap with the regions where um, the, the uh, topological invariant is negative. What we have on the right 
is a slightly different rendering of the data. It shows the magnitude of the gap, again, as identified, this transport gap identified by non-local conductance. Darker red is larger gap. Darker blue is also larger gap. The red is the region that the protocol identifies as being in the topological phase, okay? Extends over several, several millivolts, a few hundred millitesla. The maximum topological gap in the simulation is about 30 microvolts. Um, we're not trying to fit this to, to any of the measured data. That's not the purpose of this. Again, the purpose of this is to test the protocol to see whether it correctly distinguishes trivial from topological. So the shape of the topological phase here, you shouldn't read too much into. It depends on a particular disorder realization. It's different in different disorder realizations, and we're not trying to map this onto any of the experimental data. Indeed, from the same probability distribution, the same average disorder level, we had, in fact, most of the devices didn't pass the topological gap protocol. Here's an example. You can see it actually has some very large yellow regions where there are stable zero bias peaks at both sides. They actually, if you look at them, they look very nice to the eye, but from the non-local conductance, the system is basically gapless everywhere in this particular region uh, that we've zoomed in on. And so it, there's an example of how something can fail the topological gap protocol. Okay. And again, even the case of the devices that fail, we're not trying to, you know, overly read into the fact that it looks similar to this or not, because again, that varies a lot from disorder realization to disorder realization. Okay. So, um, Let's look at some experimental data, okay, from a device like this. Uh, this is one of the devices that we call device A. Uh, this is the phase diagram that we obtain for that device in the same way as we do for the sim simulated data. We analyze in the same way. You can see there's a region there in the middle that's in orange on the left. You can see it on the right. Uh, it's, it's a region um, that has uh, stable zero bias peaks at both sides. It has a gap in the interior. You go through a phase transition or gap closing to get into that region. Um, and um, that's what you see on the right. In this case, uh, just to emphasize again, each pixel that you see there is derived from both local and non-local conductances as a function of six parameters, junction transparencies, bias voltage, magnetic field, and plunger gate voltage. And each pixel there is determined not just by the values of those quantities at that point, but actually in a whole neighborhood, because determining whether it's red or blue depends very strongly on the fact not only that there's a gap there, but on the fact that you had to go through uh, a gapless crossing in order to get to that point from low field. So every one of those pixels, just to be clear, is a great deal of information boiled down to, 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 to set that color scale. Okay, in this particular device, the maximum topological gap, 23 microvolts. Uh, the area of the topological phase is around six times that maximum topological gap squared. So we look at how stable this is. It's stable on the order of one and a half millivolts in plunger gate voltage. That's, of course, dependent. The actual number there is dependent on the strongly dependent the lever arm. If the lever arm were larger, that would just be a, a bigger voltage scale. If the lever arm were smaller, it would be even smaller. So um, it's strongly dependent on the lever arm. Um, and the, right, the, the physical units here is we're measuring everything in units of the size of that topological gap. And it's about six times the square of that topological gap. It's on, on a few times the topological gap in magnetic field, a few times the topological gap in voltage. And so this is roughly the size that you would expect. We would be concerned if it were smaller than the topological gap squared, uh, and it's not. It's 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 sort of the right size of this region. Okay, uh, and just to give you a slice through the data, and again, this is for one particular. When I say cutter gate setting, it's, it's the transparencies of the two junctions. So one particular setting of the junction transparencies. This is a cut through the data, and you can see there's a color plot there showing the zero bias peaks and the gap closings, reopenings, uh, and then there's also the waterfall plots showing the same data. So again, just to emphasize, these are a particular cut through that data, but and just for one particular junction transparency, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more that goes into every single pixel here, but it's from data like this that we produce this. Okay, that same device, okay, we warmed up, put it into a different dilution refrigerator and cooled it down, okay? The maximum topological gap 
after the device had spent some time in the cold, actually increased. What we think happens when we warm it up and cool it down is the, dis the particular disorder realization gets the, the, some of those charge impurities move around and get reset. Maximum topological half increased to about 29 microvolts. The size of the region actually in the right units ended up being about the same. It's a bigger region in field and, and voltage, but it's about six times the topological gap squared. Okay. And then a week later, on the time scale of around a week, some of these voltages dripped a little bit, but the topological phase could be refound. The gap is a little bit smaller, 22 microvolts. The area of the topological phase is a little bit smaller, around four times the gap squared. Okay. So in this particular device, this phenomenon is very highly reproducible. A, it's, it's uh, survived warming up, cooling down, and measuring in a different fridge. It also has been measured, re-measured multiple times, spread out on timescales over order a week, and is very reproducible within that device. It's also reproducible from device to device. We have, as I said, multiple devices that have passed the topological gap protocol. Here's a different device that we call device B in the paper. Its topological gap's about 18 microvolts. The area is a bit smaller, but still around two times the top the, the gap squared. Uh, there's a couple, there's actually a third device that's also data shown in the paper. So this is reproducible within a single device. It's reproducible from device to device. But not all of our devices show the topological phase. And given the disorder levels that we currently have, the material choice we currently have, that's what we would expect. It's what our simulations, what we saw in our simulations. And indeed, uh, this is what we see. Here's an example of a device, which actually, if you look at the data, if you look at just the local conductances, the data from this device is absolutely beautiful. There are very large regions with very nice looking zero bias peaks that are both ends of the device and are extremely stable. Those are those large yellow regions, but it fails the protocol because when we look at the non-local conductance, it is mostly, as far as the protocol can detect, gapless or has at least very small gap in the middle of the device. Okay, in the bulk of the device. So this is an example of something that fails the protocol at stage two. There are also devices that fail at stage one. Here's one. You can see that the device has zero bias peaks at one end, quite a lot of stable zero bias peaks at one end, not so many at the other end. And so where we look at regions where we have stable zero bias peaks at both, there really aren't any extended regions. And this is something that fails at stage one. Although again, this is not, not unexpected. Okay. Now, let me just you know, wrap up looking ahead that what we've been talking about so far is devices that um, is, is devices that uh, have a single topological segment in them. Here also are, as we look ahead, we're looking towards devices that have multiple topological segments. What we have on the left here is a device with two topological segments. They're coupled to quantum dots that would be used to read out the parity of the pairs of Majorana and zero modes and could be used to do fusion of Majorana and zero modes, fusion of quasi-particles, two different non-commuting fusion operations. What we have on the right is a more complicated device that has that is in fact um, two qubits. Um, and with, this has four topological regions. There are again quantum dots that can be used to read out those Majorana, pairs of Majorana and zero modes. A device like this can do fusion and braiding. Uh, and in fact, if we look at this device and we repeatedly tile the plane with this, this is something that, this is a device design that uh, dovetails extremely nicely and allows for an efficient implementation of the recently discovered Hastings Ha code, an example of one of these flow error correcting codes, um, which has very favorable error correcting properties.